This morning, we will be in Philippians chapter 2. Actually, the end of chapter 1, and, and all the way, in, uh, mostly of chapter 2. <clears throat> now, if you are unfamiliar with Philippians, Philippians is in the New Testament. You turn to the New Testament, you have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And then after that, you have the letters, well, you have Acts, which is a history of the Apostles. And after that, you have the letters of Paul. You have big letters, Romans, Corinthian letters, and then starts the small letters, which you have Galatians, Ephesians, and then Philippians. So Philippians is towards the back end of your Bible. <clears throat> now some of you may be wondering, hold on a second, today is Easter, shouldn't we be doing something special? You know, shouldn't we be going through a different section, something that's more Easter-ish? Right? Why are we going through the same book that we've been going through for the last month, or the same letter? Well, here's why. One of the things that Easter represents is the fact that no single day is actually any more important than another. Because when Jesus rose, He rose as Lord over all things. Not just Lord over Easter. He's not Lord just this one Sunday a year. And He's not Lord just on Sundays. No, He's Lord every day. And so we should really celebrate His resurrection every day. And the reason why we as believers come on Sunday morning is because Sunday is the first day of the week. And that's the day that He rose. So we come celebrating the resurrection. Everything we are as believers is because Jesus lives. Because He lives, we are here. Not simply because He died, but because He lives. And so whether it's Easter or whether it's... May, July, June, August. It doesn't matter. We celebrate Easter. That's the first reason. The second reason is because we serve a God who is sovereign and providential. And He works all things for the good of His pleasure, for the good of His will. And He foresaw before the foundations of the world that as we started in Philippians four weeks ago, He knew I wouldn't be here last Sunday. I was actually asked to go preach in a church in Greensboro. And this was a commitment I had agreed to several months ago. And so that's why I wasn't here last Sunday. And God knew that. Because if I had been here last Sunday, then we would have preached, I would have preached this text last Sunday. But the neat thing is that this text is specifically about the resurrection of Christ. And so somehow, in God's sovereignty and in His providence, He orchestrated things so that as we started Philippians, things worked out in such a way that we would be in the passage that we are this morning. Now all that to say that although no day is more important than another, it is good to take some time and reflect specifically on these things, as we will today. Because as we see around us in the culture, whether people are raised in church or whether they are not, this time of the year is a time that enables us to reflect on something that we might normally not. See, during this time, we might use words and terms that we might not use other times. For example, we might use terms like resurrection, or we might use terms like salvation, or we might use terms like gospel, or hope, or being saved, or eternal life. And if we're not careful, we will use those terms so frequently and so commonly that we might end up using them in a way that we might not actually know what they mean. It's like Maddox. All right, so Maddox is four years old. He just went to the nursery over there. And for some reason, he thinks that speed bumps, you know, the little mound that you go over, are called speed limits. Every time we go over, he's like, oh, we went over the speed limit. <laughs> it's like, don't go around telling people that, man. <laughs> See, he's using terms in a way that he doesn't really understand. Hopefully, as he grows up, he, he will know better. Uh, but... It's very important that we understand what these things mean. And as Paul is writing this letter to his friends in a church in Philippi, he is very, very intentional. And he is very concerned that they would grasp the reality of what the gospel really is, what salvation really is, what life in Jesus really is. That's why his theme, I believe, the central piece of the book of Philippians is verse 27. Chapter 1, verse 27. Let your manner of life 
or the King James might have, let your conversation be worthy of the gospel of Christ. The reason the King James uses conversation is because the word there is a word that means sort of like citizen. Your day-to-day -day tasks, in all that you do, in your day-to-day -day things, in your conversation, in your manner of life, live it in a way worthy of the gospel of Christ. So there we have it. He's using this word gospel. What does that mean? You see, the Philippians lived in Philippi, a colony of the Roman Empire in what today would be northern Greece. And much like our culture today, Philippi was a culture of somewhat of a maj page, a melting pot of different ideas, different ways of looking at life, different worldviews. Whether it was the Greek philosophers learning their way through from Plato and Aristotle, or the Epicureans, or, or the Stoics, or whether it was the Roman citizens and the imperial cult that was in charge of expanding the name of Caesar throughout the Roman Empire. There were all these many ideas circulating around, just like in our days. It wasn't one cut and dry thing. And then the Philippians are in this mi the middle of this context, and they're hearing all these things, and a lot of these words are being used by these different groups. Because they are all, like today, concerned with answering the big questions of life. And they're all giving their own answers. So, for example, they are all seeking to answer, what is wrong with the world? And how do we fix it? Or do we fix it? Can we fix it? Should we fix it? And if we can, how and or who? The Platonists, the followers of Plato, believed that what was wrong with this world is the material things in this world. What we really need to do is attain to a way of thinking that is beyond the material. We need to enter into this, the world of forms and spirituality. That's where we find our fullness, not in the world of material things. Sounds familiar with some things around this. The Stoics were rather similar. They said, if you want to fulfill life, you need to attain to become a sage, a wise individual who is unaffected by the world around you. Because after all, this world contains what it means to be divine. See, they believed in a God, in this divine power that infiltrated all of life, that was inside of everything, inside the tree, inside the water, inside of you, and inside of me. And to them, the goal in life to fix the problems of life was somehow being in touch with the divine existence within me, finding the light within me and living according to that. Does that sound familiar? That's Oprah for you. Oprah, Dr. Phil, all those others. Find the goodness within. Nothing is new under the sun. The Epicureans would say, well, there may be, there are gods and divinities, but they're kind of like a watchmaker. You see, they, they make the watch and they turn it on, they made the world and they step away and they have nothing to do with it. The world just moves on and our job is to just do the best that we can, find pleasure, pleasure is good, pain is bad, move on. Sound familiar? That's our culture today. And so the Philippians are hearing all these things. And hearing these terms, here's, here's deliverance, here's salvation, here's the good life. And then comes the next. Here's what's wrong with the world. The world is disorderly. This world needs peace. This world needs order. This world needs a king. And who else? but the son of the divine himself, the very own son of God, Caesar. He will bring peace. In fact, he brought what they call Pax Romana, Roman peace, conquered the known world. And guess what they called this message? That, king, that, that Caesar was the one to bring deliverance. They called it the gospel, the good news of Caesar. And he sent out heralds throughout the Roman Empire proclaiming, you need deliverance, and Caesar is here to bring it. So Paul is in the midst of this, and he knows his friends are in the midst of this, and he wants them to clear it. He wants them to be sure that they are living a life worthy, not of the gospel of Caesar, but of the gospel of Christ, the gospel of Jesus. And we must ask, why? 
What's so wrong with the way of the Platonists? What's so wrong with the way of the philosophers? What's so wrong with the way of Oprah? Doesn't it actually turn out to some good things every now and then? I mean, what's so wrong with politics and good legislation and having a good leader? Didn't they, after all, have a Pax Romana? What's so wrong with that? And yes, they do bring some things that are good. But the problem is that at the end of the day, even the best of them end up losing to the greatest enemy. Even the richest, the smartest, the most knowledgeable, the strongest, every single one of them lost to the great and true enemy. Because you see, the enemy is not that people need a better way of thinking. The enemy is not that people need better laws and legislation. The enemy is not that we need in a society a better structure and just the right person sitting on the throne. The enemy is death. At the end, all of them lost. Every single one was conquered by the true enemy, whose name is death. And the reason Paul is so committed to spreading the gospel, the good news, the message of Jesus, is because he was confident, he knew it in his bones, that here's the one who didn't lose. Here's the one who faced the true enemy and actually came out on the other side. And actually won. And actually dealt with the problem the right way. He knew that in Jesus, the solution to our problem was actually given. And so what is the gospel? Read with me, chapter 2, starting in verse 5. <clears throat> Have this mind among you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. The King James has a thing to be, did not count it robbery. What in the world? The idea there is grasping something or taking something by force for your own advantage. Taking something to hurt others and benefit myself. That's why I use the word robbery, because that's what you do when you rob. You take things for yourself. You're selfish and you hurt others for yourself. Jesus did not count being equal with God something just for his own advantage. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. You see, the whole world was saying, the way to solution is by strength and power and might. But here comes the true king, and how does he do it? By giving himself up. He's saying the whole world has tried. It doesn't work. The sword doesn't work. Legislation doesn't work. Right? Better ways of thinking don't work. What you need is a servant who dies on behalf of people. But it doesn't stop there. Being, uh, <clears throat> becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Verse 9. Therefore, or for this reason, God has highly exalted him and given him or bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now that is very polemical right there. You're saying that in the middle of Philippi in one of the biggest hubs of the Roman Empire, there was one logo. Caesar is Lord. And here's Paul. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. So here's the gospel. That God became man in order to die and deal with the great enemy. And in dying and dealing with the great enemy, he rises and conquers all the powers of darkness. That's why he says, gave him a name above every name, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. There is no powers. The problem, like I said, people thinking incorrectly or wrong laws, the problem is that humanity has become bondage to the dark powers. They have worshipped the dark powers, and they've worshipped creation instead of the creator. They are bonded by these powers holding them hostage. And here's Jesus, and he slays them all down and puts them to shame. And he 
does that so that he can become the true king. To be a king, you have to defeat the enemies. And he defeats every single one of them. That is the gospel, that Jesus is on the throne of the universe. That he is the king. And now, for those of you who are thinking, we should be asking questions. We should be asking, okay, he's on the throne of the universe. So what? Who cares? What is that to me? Well, here, that, that was the defining gospel. Here's, so what? Because this, since he's conquered the powers, he is now able to take humanity and give them salvation. Or in better words, I think, deliverance, rescue. He is able to rescue them out of the grips of darkness, out of the grips of Satan, out of the bondage of the powers of darkness, because he is king. That is what salvation means. Far too long and far too often I hear preachers and teachers, and, and meaning well, saying that salvation is simply the fact that we've been saved from sin. We've been saved from sin, from the penalty of sin. We don't get punished anymore. We won't have to infer God's judgment. We get saved from the power of sin. Sin is no longer over us. And we will one day be saved from the presence of sin. I'm not denying that all those things are true. But that is a limited understanding of true salvation. Salvation has another side to this coin. That not only have we been saved from something, but we've been saved for something. And here's the four. Look at me, verse 12. Let's continue. Therefore, in other words, because Jesus reigns, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. In other words, it doesn't matter if I'm there or not. Yes, I'm Paul, but don't worry, I'm just a servant. The true king is there. Here's salvation. Because these things, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because God is the one who works in you. In other words, the same God that sits in the throne of the universe is the God in you. That's salvation. That God has made a way so that He will actually live inside of people. That He will actually not only work in their lives, but He will work through their lives. Through for what? And He continues. Look, verse 12. Verse 13, actually. <clears throat> Sorry, verse 12, I'm sorry. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who works in you. Where is he working? To will and to work for his good pleasure. Do you see, salvation is something that God does in us that enables us to live a life that is pleasing to him. We who were once in bondage to darkness in bondage to selfishness, in bondage to self-seeking, are now being restored in the inside in such a way that we can live a life that pleases Him. And what's the point of this? He continues, look, verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God. Do you see that? Salvation is about becoming children of God. Salvation is about being turned from, become, from being children of the darkness to being children of the light. And he continues. Salvation has a purpose. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. The, another way of translating that is that you shine like stars in the cosmos, that's world. The cosmos is what we use to refer to the universe. So what he's saying there is, you've become children of God so that you might shine like stars in the night sky. Holding forth, verse 15, 16, holding forth or holding fast to the word of life. Salvation is about taking individuals who were once enemies of God, useless to his kingdom, and now doing such a work that not only is he working in them so that they might please him, but that he now begins to work through them so that they might continue this saving, restoring work of all creation. If the gospel is that Jesus is Lord of all and he's restoring all things, 
Salvation is that we get to take part in that. Is that He transforms us in such a way that we get to take part in that. Once again, I'm not denying the eternal aspect of things. I'm just saying that salvation is not just for the then and there. Salvation is for the here and now as well. So all that for way of introduction. And I intentionally made it so our introduction lasts the majority of it. Because if we grasp that, if we grasp that, what salvation really means, what gospel really means, then everything else falls into place. And we don't have to spend hours and hours and hours dissecting every single little word and going, taking 12 years to go through the book of Philippians. We don't have to do that because if we understand the central key of what salvation means, what gospel means, then we can actually understand the whole thing. I mean, after all, when Paul wanted to speak to his friends in Philippi, he didn't write to them one verse every day. Hey, here you go. Tomorrow I'll send you another one. He didn't shoot them little 30 second audios. What he did was he wrote the whole book, the whole letter, which takes about 20 minutes to read. Here's what I want you to know read it, 20 minutes. Read it again, read it again. In the same way that when we watch a movie, we would never watch the movie in two minute clips, would we? I mean, you might if. If you have nothing better to do with yourself. But, you know, sometimes Jessica and I, will, if we, there's a long movie, two hours, I don't know, two and a half, we'll split it in like 45 minutes, 30 minutes. But we will never watch it 30 seconds at a time. Because or else you'll never understand the movie. That's how scripture is. I want to encourage you that one of the best things you can do is read scripture in large portions. Large portions. Because then you will begin to grasp the author's intention. And here's where a study Bible, a good study Bible, will come in handy because at the introduction it will lay out the big structures, the big scenes, the big chapters. And you can just read one chapter, or not the chapters we have laid out here, but the big sections, which might be one chapter, might be two chapters, might be one, half a chapter. And knowing this, that He lives and He reigns, and those who are in Him are called to live for Him, then we can come back to what it means to live a life worthy of the gospel. As you can see, my title is, Because He Lives, dot, dot, dot. Because He lives, certain things will overflow. Now, this is where we'll go back to verse 27 in chapter 1. And the idea here is that that central portion where he lays out the gospel of Jesus sits like the center of a hurricane. And the rest of the letter just spins around this center. Chapter 1 and the first half of chapter 2 spins around the gospel, the exaltation of Christ. And chapter 3 and chapter 4 also point back to it. So if we keep that in mind, now that we go through verse 27 to verse 30, we're going to see, and things are going to start, hopefully, becoming a little bit clearer. So here's where it is, verse 27 to 30. Because He lives, we can stand united and unafraid together. Listen, only let your manner in life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, once again, it doesn't matter if I'm there because the king is there, if I'm there or not, that I may hear that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, not being frightened anything by your opponents. And this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your, there it is, salvation. See it? And that this is from God. Why? Because it's been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for Him. Once again, that's salvation. That we become, we embody the life of Christ here and now. It's not that we're actually dying the same way Jesus did, like we're dying an atonement death for the sake of the world. We're not doing that. But we actually embody His life. We continue His mission. It's been granted to you for His sake that we should not only believe, not only understand the doctrines and have those right answers in the mind, but that it would actually conquer our entire beings to the point where we would suffer for His sake. And He says, engage in the same conflict that you saw I had and now you hear I still have. In other words, Paul's saying, listen, this is not just the life of an apostle. It's not just the life of the superstars. It's the life, it's the meat and potatoes, it's the rice and beans if you're from Brazil. It's the rice and beans or it's the coffee with milk. It's the, just the basic stuff. Peanut butter and crackers of Christianity. First, because he lives, 
we can stand united, unafraid, while the whole world is fighting with each other, picking and griping and arguing and trying to overcome one another, we can stand unafraid because our true king has already conquered everything. We don't have to worry about those minute details because he's already taken care. Our job is to stand united. Now, even in our midst right now, there are things brewing up inside of us that have the potential to create division. Perhaps, maybe think, oh, that preacher really should be wearing a tie. Maybe I should, but I'm not. And that's okay. Because he lives. That doesn't mean we don't have respect. And I don't mean to be disrespectful by not wearing a tie. But there are certain things that we allow to kind of fall to the wayside because they're not crucial. Or perhaps we're thinking, somebody took my seat this morning. Arr. There will always be things that will have the potential to divide us. But likewise, he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. That the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in us. So when that thought comes, I can take a captive and say, I don't care. You know, maybe a tie would be nice, so I'll wear a tie. But let's do all things in a way that pursues unity and godliness. Standing united in the face of opposition because we can. Now here's one thing that we ought to always remember because sadly, I was listening to another message sermon this week from this very same passage and the preacher did something that I, I think is rather common in, in our circles of Christianity in North America. This idea, these things are true and so you ought to live like this. You have the obligation to live like this. Get your act together. Live worthy of the gospel. Now, am I denying that we have obligations? Of course not. Trust and obey. There's no other way of being happy with Jesus but to trust and obey. We have an obligation. Because he lives, we ought to live this way. But we must not forget the other side of the coin. That because he lives, we can live this way. Why? The same God that sits in the throne of the universe lives in us both to will, to want, and to do. I call this the ought to, ought to can complex. The ought to can complex. We ought to and we can. We ought to and we can because we want to. Because he's working in us. So that we will want to do the thing that pleases him. Which is united and unafraid. Because we can, because he lives in us, because he lives, we can stand united, unafraid. Second, go to chapter 2, verse 1, continuing. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort in love, any participation, or any fellowship in the Spirit, or any affection and sympathy. In other words, see, he's pointing forward to what he's going to talk about in the Gospel, in the exaltation of Christ. If these things are true... If there really is such a thing as courage in Christ, if there really is such a thing as unity in the Spirit, if there really is such a thing as compassion, and the word there for compassion or affection is, I'm only going to say it because I think it sounds cool, it's called splankna, splankna. In Greek, it's the word for bowels. Splankna. It's what we would use, or they would use, to refer to the heart of the emotions. I mean, think about it. When you're happy, you get butterflies in your belly. When you're sad or afraid, you get kind of like a cold chills. They understood, the ancients did, that our emotions came from our belly. So when they refer to a word like affection or compassion or true, true sensation, they would refer to bowels, right? And some of your translations might have that, right? And the idea there, I think a good English word would be empathy. Not just that we understand how you feel, like sympathy, but that we actually feel with you. That's empathy. If there is such a thing that God has accomplished to enable us to have empathy, to have bowels of mercy, how then should we live? Look at what he says, verse 2. Complete my joy by being of the same mind. In other words, have this same mind. Align yourselves to this way of thinking. Live this way. Because these things are true. How? Having the same love. Being in full accord of one another. Doing nothing from selfish ambition and conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. In other words... Because he lives, 
Not only can we stand united and unafraid in the face of opposition, but the reason we can stand united is because he lives, we can love one another, just like he loved. Did you catch what Paul is doing there? Don't do it out of selfish ambition, but in humility, hint, hint, or wink, wink, he did not count equality with God, something prideful, but in humility, let us what? Consider not only our own interests, but the interests of others. He became a servant. He served. For decades and centuries, theologians and teachers have shed hundreds and hundreds of pages of paper trying to explain what does it mean that Jesus emptied himself? What does it mean that did, it, did he lose his divinity? Did he become? What does that mean? Here's what it means, John chapter 13. That the creator of the whole world got up took off his nice clothes, took on a towel, wrapped it around his waist, went to his friends who had filthy, smelly, dirty feet, and he knelt down and he washed their feet. He did the job of a servant. That's what it means that Jesus emptied himself. He did not count his rights, something to be used for his sake only, but for the sake of others. So often in our Christian world, I see people arguing, bickering, Christians, so-called, saying, I have the right to do this, I have the right to do that. You know what Christian liberty is? Christian liberty is the right to give up your rights. People often say, oh, Christian liberty, I have the liberty to do this and do that. Yeah, you sure do. But Christian liberty is that you have the right to give them up. And that it doesn't matter, because you already have what really matters, which is life in the kingdom, to live as Christ, to die as gain. Who cares if I have to wear a mask to go in the store? For the sake of others, we give up our rights. And we do that because we ought to, and we do that because we can, because He lives. Moving on. We live, because he lives, we can stand united, unafraid. Because he lives, we can live lives of love just like he did. Not doing things out of selfish ambition. You can see there's enough of that in the world already. There's selfish people around. This is kind of a constant theme in our, in our house. We say, guys, there's enough selfish, lazy people in this world. We don't need any more. We need to play a part. We need to do our job. Whether that's putting water for the dogs or whether that's putting away the dishes. We need to do something. That's what Paul is saying. Guys, this world is full of selfishness. Something has really happened that enables us to actually be different. So let's do it. Third, now we, we've already gone through the gospel, so let's jump through that, through verses 6 and 11. And we jump all the way to verse 12. Remember, 6 and 11... Right, chapter 2, 6, and 11 serves like a central point in the entire book. And everything just spins off of that. And then here's verse 12. Because he lives, verse 12, Therefore, beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure, doing all things without grumbling and disputing. Why? So that you may be blameless and innocent or above reproach, children of God without blemish. Because He lives, we can live lives of holiness. We can live lives of holiness. And if you remember back to the first message, that we first started when Paul says, I'm writing to you saints. And how I tried to explain that what the word saints means is that holy people. And that to be holy means at least two things. Now holy is kind of, holiness is kind of like a diamond with a bunch of different cuts. But there's two biggest cuts. And the first thing is holy is this. That you can actually please God. That you can please God. You can live in a way that makes Him happy. And because of that, you can enter his presence. Now, if you're not holy, you can't. It's kind of like I was talking to the kids yesterday. Think about darkness. Let's say we turn off all these lights, we closed all the windows. Darkness. What would happen as soon as we turn on the light? The darkness goes away. Why? Because darkness can't do anything about light. 
That's what holiness is. If we are dark, we can't stand in the presence of God. But because He lives, if He lives in me, we can be holy and I can please God and I can stand in His presence. That's the first thing. The second thing about being holy is not because we can stand in His presence and we can <clears throat> please Him, we can actually represent Him to the world. We can be His image bearers. Here's what He says, looking on. Verse 13, It's God who works in you to please, to work for His good pleasure. Verse 14, Doing all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish, where? In the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, as stars in the night sky, holding fast to the word of life. Holiness means that we get to represent God. We get to be His image. We get to become like Jesus, what Jesus was when He was here on earth, and what He will be when He returns. We get to be a small little part of that. I'm not saying we become the same level of authority as Jesus is, but it does say, after all, that the saints will reign in His kingdom with Him. And that's what holiness means. And because He lives, we can be unafraid as we go through this neighborhood bearing His image, taking those food boxes in the name of Jesus, saying, here, Jesus lives, and He loves you, and He provides for your need. We'll be back. And as you come back, we review more and more, and more and more. And we can do that because He lives. Now, just a little hint here, and here's the thing with Scripture, that as you read Scripture, there's a surface level, right, that's easy for us, and as we continue to read, we can kind of dig deeper and dig deeper. And Paul kind of gives out a little wink of the eye here for whoever has ears to hear. He says this, look, verse 14, Do all things without grumbling and disputing. Now look at verse... 15, we are children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. What is he doing there? For those of you that know the story of the people of Israel in the wilderness, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, maybe the orders will be different, can't remember. Um, remember how the people of Israel, as soon as they left Egypt, and they're in the wilderness, and God provides, and God provides, what do they begin to do? Grumble, 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 pro complain. He's saying... He's trying to wink at you and say, for those of you who know, remember that? Don't be like that. And then he says this, but children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. That crooked and twisted comes from Deuteronomy 32. Listen up. This is at the end of the Pentateuch. Moses is about to die. They've made it their whole way. And he looks at that generation that has left Egypt and he says this. They have, he's speaking to God, they have been corrupt. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are crooked, twisted generation or perverse, some, some translations say. But Paul is taking that exact phrase and putting it here. You are children of God without blemish in the midst of a twisted and crooked generation. And why is he doing that? I think because... If we're not careful, we'll see, see, I'm a child of God in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Look at the crooked and twisted generation. I can see them through the window. Oh, those rebels, godless people out there, don't they know better for them? If we're not careful, we will forget that the children of Israel, that the first recipients of that phrase, crooked, twisted, were the very same people who saw God open the Red Seas. The same people that walked through the Red Sea, dry ground. The same people that saw the blaze of fire coming on top of Mount Sinai. The same people that saw the pillar of cloud of fire leading them by night through the wilderness. The same people that ate the bread from heaven, the manna. The same people that drank the water from the rock. The same people that had the cloud of witness descend upon the tabernacle. They saw it all. But they failed to trust God. They thought, well, I've seen it all. I'm the chosen people. And they wasted it. And the danger here is that we would do the same. And he's hinting at us. He's saying, listen, don't let go of the word of life. That's why he finishes that holding fast or holding firmly to the word of life. That generation let go of the word of life, and they were holding on to the gifts of God. 
instead of to the God of the gifts. It's like my cat. Well, we have a little cat. We have kind of like a zoo at home. We have two dogs, a cat, two kids. It's crazy. Um, and our cat, sometimes we'll give her little treats, and I'll, I'll put it on the ground, and I'll point, there you go, Jesse, and I'll point like this, right? And guess what she does? She comes over and licks my finger instead of going to the treat. She is content with the sign. Here, there is the gift. And she forgets about the actual gift. She forgets about the actual real thing. And the people of Israel were so content with the signs. Oh, we've walked through the Red Sea. Oh, we've seen the pillar of cloud. Oh, we know his testimonies. We know his law. And they forgot about the real thing. All those things were meant to point to the word of life, to God himself. Jesus said, you have all these things, but you think you find life in them. Yet they were the ones who pointed to me. I am the life. I am the way. I am the truth. And Paul is saying, if we're not careful, we will allow ourselves to be deceived that way. But because he lives, we can hold on to the word of life and we can then hold it forth. Because he lives, we can stand firm and unafraid. Because he lives, we can stand united in love. Because he lives, we can live holy lives like he lived and represent him to the world. And because he lives, we can know that our life and our labor will not be in vain. Listen to what Paul says, verse 16. Holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ... I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad, I rejoice, and I rejoice with you all. And likewise, please, you rejoice with me. Be glad and rejoice with me. Well, Paul is saying this. He knows the day of Christ, the day when every knee will bow. And he knows that two of those knees will be his. And he knows that when he bows, he's going to have to give an account for what he has done with his life. Whether good or evil, he's going to have to give an account. And his goal in life is to live life in such a way so that when he kneels down or stands before Christ, he'll be able to say, God, I am what I am by your grace. I've done what I've done by your grace. And hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And Paul is saying, even if that means I'm poured out, I die for your sake. It's like an offering. It's like a sacrifice pleasing to God. And he'll be able to say it was worth it all. And he's saying, join me in this life. Join me in this way of living. Be glad with me. Bear the marks of Christ with me. Yesterday, I got asked by a friend to go help um, repair a part of the roof of his house and I wasn't there for long I was there just for a few hours but we were you know ripping and taking a bunch of things out and when I got home and I was taking a shower and, I, and my hands were burning I have a bunch of cuts in my hand I was like man and I said and I thought to myself boy it was worth it because I was able to help my friend it was worth it I have a little cuts here and that's what Paul is saying live in such a way so that when we stand before Christ, not every scar is going to be hidden. The shameful scars will. But the scars that will remind us of the life lived for Christ, they'll be there. And he will be standing us showing his scars. and says, see, you're part of the family. We all have scars. But our scars are not in vain. Our troubles are not in vain. Our labor is not in vain. But those who build the house... Without God, they labor in vain. Those who watch the city without God, they watch the city in vain. But God provides for His beloved even while they sleep. Because He lives, we can live in Him. Amen? Let us pray. Father, You know our hearts. You know that we can do nothing, but because Jesus lives, you are working in us, so that through him, you live through us, so that the glory might be to you. You know the story of each one here. You know their pasts. But because Christ lives, even though we lived a shameful life in the past, we were once useless. You can now make us useful. Because, we once, because Jesus lives, even though once we lived lives of shame, now we can stand unashamed. Because He lives.
and we can be given a life that counts. I pray that you would work in the hearts of those who are here. I pray that you would direct us so that we would live lives of unity and f standing firm in the face of opposition, living lives of love, living lives of holiness, knowing that our labor will not be in vain because of Jesus. And it's in his name, the name that's above every name that we pray. Amen.